Welcome to Conference Highlights, recorded in front of a live audience at an evidence-based perioperative medicine at EBPOM conference. EBPOM are world leaders in perioperative education, so why not join us at our next meeting with a special discount for Top Med Talk subscribers? Look us up on www.ebpom, that's E-B-P-O-M, dot com. Top Med Talk. Welcome back, everyone. Moving along in this really interesting Poets' Day, the next segment of presentations is going to be more physiological on physical activity and exercise interventions preoperatively. My name is Sue Ward. I'm an exercise physiologist, so obviously I have a strong vested interest. And it's my pleasure to introduce our first speaker, Professor Denny Levitt, who's professor and consultant in perioperative medicine and critical care at Southampton. And Denny's going to talk to us about preoperative inspiratory muscle training. Denny. Thank you, Sue. Uh, thanks for that kind introduction. I'm going to start with a type of exercise training that you may be a little bit less familiar with than whole body exercise training. And what I'd like to do over the next 10 or 15 minutes or so is first of all take you through a little bit of the epidemiology of post-op pulmonary complications because it's a really important problem. Um, how you might measure post-op pulmonary complications and how you might identify patients preoperatively who are at particular risk of getting a post-op complication because, after all, those are the patients we may want to intervene upon to try and reduce that risk. And then I'm going to describe a little bit about inspiratory muscle training and how it differs from other sorts of physiotherapy and and then go through some of the evidence that supports it and then finally tell you about a multicenter trial that we're going to be starting next year across the UK. So there are a number of reasons why around the time of surgery you're going to be at a higher risk of getting a pulmonary complication. First of all, there are anaesthetic-related factors. We all know about basal atelectasis at the end of anaesthesia. You may be hypoxemic, and you may, as a result either of your anaesthesia or your subsequent opioids, have reduced central respiratory drive. And all of this can lead to sputum retention, which, moving forward, can turn into a post-operative pneumonia or infective complication. And then sometimes there are surgical factors, for example, with a thoracotomy, where there may actually be damage to the respiratory muscles themselves, plus or minus atelectasis as a result of that. And then if you take that picture, it's sort of the perfect storm, really, and then you make the patient give them a lot of pain so they can't take a deep breath. And if they happen to have underlying pre-existing lung disease and poor respiratory efficiency at the beginning of this whole procedure, it's not surprising, really, that quite a number of patients do go on to develop post-op pulmonary complications. One of the difficulties when you look at the literature generally is that the incidence in big cohort studies of pulmonary complications varies from sort of in the low you know, 5 to 9% all the way up to 40 to 60% in some of the case series. And a lot of that depends upon the definition that is used for a post-op complication. In fact, pulmonary complications, although we focus a huge amount on cardiac complications, are more common than cardiac complications in the post-operative period. And I think if you actually stop to think, if you're an intensivist, for example, about emergency admissions from the ward in surgical patients post-operatively, if I think about the last you know, 10, 15, 20 patients I've seen, the vast majority of them seem to have a primary pulmonary problem and pneumonia it seems to be more common than the post-operative MI that we have spent an awful long time focusing on trying to prevent. So in the States, it's estimated that more than a million complications happen annually and there are a significant number of associated deaths and not only that, in terms of constrained finances, nearly 5 million additional hospitalised days for patients with post-operative complications. So just to look at a couple of reasonably recent cohorts, so there's the MET study that we'll hear about later today. You can see there the respiratory complication rate was nearly 21% where the ischemic cardiac complication was 5%. And if you looked at the ISOS study, which was the International Surgical Outcomes, a big cohort study of nearly 45,000 patients from the UK, Australasia, and the US, uh, respiratory complications, a lower risk population, at 2%, and with myocardial infarction at 0.3%, so two or threefold. There is an awareness in the community and in the literature, this was something that was published, a consensus statement in the BJA earlier this year, that we really do need some well-powered, high-quality clinical trials to evaluate interventions that aim to reduce the risk of post-op complications. 
And one of the problems currently is this great mixture of post-op definitions. Because when is a pneumonia a pneumonia? Is it when you've got a temperature? Is it when someone gave you some antibiotics because they thought you might have a pneumonia? Or is it when you have chest x-ray changes? Or is it a combination of all of the above? And you can imagine, unless you decide that prospectively at the beginning of the procedure, you can end up with a great variety of data. And so this paper called for a standardization of definitions to be used in perioperative clinical trials so that we can actually effectively assess the value of interventions to reduce this risk. And so there have been two recently published standardized definitions of PPCs. One of the things to point out, first of all, is that the majority of PPC, and I'm going to call it that because it's easier now, it stands for postoperative pulmonary complication. One of the problems is that a lot of these measures are composite measures. Now, the advantage of composite measures or outcome measures is that you have a higher instance of the outcome that you desire, which means in terms of designing trials and in terms of statistical power for a given number of subjects, that gives you more power to detect a difference. The problem, however, can be that when you put a lot of different complications into a composite, then you are giving equal weight in terms of the outcome of your trial to each element of that composite. So that is fine if all the elements of that composite occur at about the same frequency. But if they have wildly different frequencies, that means that although your primary outcome talks about, for example, death and pneumonia, but if pneumonia happens 999 times and death happens one, you and I know that the outcome is actually about pneumonia, not death, but the primary outcome will still say death and pneumonia. So that is a potential limitation of these mixed composite outcomes. So this is the ESICM and the European Society of Anesthesia standardized outcome for post-op pulmonary complications that they've used. And that's here on the left. And just suggested this year by the STEP Compact, which is another perioperative outcome standardization group, this one here from the BJA. They've got a lot of similarities. The removal of these types of pulmonary complication has been made on the basis of this problem I said where you can have different incidences and if the pathophysiological process underlying each of them is not similar, it doesn't really make theological sense to combine them. As yet, because this has just been proposed, we don't know the incidence of pulmonary complications post-op using this new scale. The advantage of this is that it's actually the outcome measure that's been used in the ARISCAT score, which I'll come to in a minute, which is a way of screening patients. So we do have some idea in prospectively validated cohorts of what the expected incidence using the post-op pulmonary complication definition on the left. So we want to know which patients are at risk. And clearly there's going to be a combination of patient factors, i.e. do they have underlying lung disease? And then surgical factors, are you having your toenail done or are you having an esophagectomy with a thoracotomy? Clearly that's a very different situation. And not surprisingly, subsequently scores or indices that have been developed to try and identify the high risk of pulmonary complication use both patient and surgical factors. And the ARISCAT score is a score that was derived initially in the Catalonians of Spain, and then it was prospectively validated in a very large sample from across Western Europe. And what they have come up with or derived is a score that gives you a number here. You can see these are all the factors that are involved. And you can have either a low, a moderate, or a high risk of pulmonary complications, depending on your score from the ARISCAT score. You can see in brackets there the approximate rate of complications in each of those cohorts. So in terms of powering a study to look at complications, it gives you some idea of the incident of your outcome. So, moving on, having introduced post-op pulmonary complications, what is inspiratory muscle training? You can really think of inspiratory muscle training as essentially exercise training for the respiratory muscles. By that, I mean the diaphragm, the intercostal muscles, and the accessory muscles. You may not think of it, because in healthy individuals, ventilation and respiratory function is not limiting to exercise, but in patients with cardiorespiratory disease which is quite a large proportion of our patients, or deconditioned patients. In fact, respiratory muscle deconditioning can play a part in exercise limitation and functional capacity limitation. And whilst they're doing relatively little in the community and are relatively physically inactive, this may not be a problem day to day if they're not exerting themselves. But the problem in the perioperative period is that there may be an imbalance between supply and demand for respiratory muscle work. Because of all the things I've just mentioned, the basal atelectasis, the pain, tachypnea, 
in the context of sepsis, sometimes an increased work of breathing, there is increased demand for respiratory work post-operatively. And some of those factors might be anesthesia or surgery related. And then there's the underlying disease process that may be present in the patient, such as COPD or bronchiectasis. And baseline gas exchange efficiency is probably very important. And the thought process behind inspiratory muscle training is that by exercise training the, the respiratory muscles specifically, you may reduce the work of breathing and so improve or reduce that imbalance between supply and demand in the post-operative period. So what sort of training do you actually get the patient to do and what actually is it? It's essentially resistance training, just as it would be for whole body exercise. And what you do is you impose an external load on the respiratory muscles by having the patient inspire or the subject against a resistance. And most of the studies that have looked at this technique in the vast majority of patient populations have used approximately 30 breaths twice a day. And the minimum period for efficacy appears to be around about two weeks, but there is benefit of training the respiratory muscles up to at least eight to 12 weeks and you see a training response, which is hyperbolic. So you get initially large changes, and then there tends to be a plateau to after eight to 12 weeks of training. And there's this physiological measure, which is the maximum inspiratory pressure, or the MIP. And what that is, is a measure, essentially, of your maximum inspiration. And that is how you titrate the patient's activity, so their muscle training during this technique. And what you do is you need to set the resistance so that it's more than 30% of the patient's maximum inspiratory pressure. And then you get them to do 30 breaths at that. But just like whole body exercise training, if you want the patient's respiratory muscles to continue to improve, you have to change the load over time. So you can't just give them the same load for eight weeks. It would just be like essentially making the exercise easier and easier over time. High intensity training, which they've defined as more than 60% of the maximum respiratory pressure, has been associated with faster improvements in MIP with a shorter duration. So that is the preferred protocol currently for inspiratory muscle training. There are two main types of device that are commercially available currently. So this is the basic device, which was the first that was developed, and is a mechanical resistance device. And what you can see here, there's a mouthpiece there for the patient, and they inspire through this little machine, and it's a handheld machine. I'll show you a video in a second of a patient using something similar. And here you can see there's a mechanical spring-loaded valve. And essentially, you tighten or loosen that, and that is the resistance against which the patient breathes. And it's a fixed resistance, which is fixed and has the same resistance all the way through the breath. And as the patient improves during the training program, you just make the resistance. You increase the resistance, usually by 5% uh, on, a, on a weekly basis, uh, depending on how they're performing. More recently, in the last few years, there's been the development of electronic versions of these devices. And what is the advantage of an electronic device? Well, actually, it's, it's, a, it's a clever device that allows you to change the load on the inspiratory muscles during the breath. So as you get to maximum inspiration, your muscles naturally get less strong as they're nearer their maximum length. And so if you're using the fixed mechanical device, that tends to lead to shortened breaths and patients stop before they take a full breath in because it's hard work. Where these new electronic devices, the load declines towards the end of the breath. And what's the net result of that? Why does that matter? It essentially means for each breath you get more training. And so the initial studies, this is an example here, you can think of this as degree of training over time, and this is with mechanical device, and this is with electronic device. So you can see the early studies suggest that there are some benefits to using this device, on top of which actually records sessions and records data. So you can see how the patient is complying, and not only that, you can see the quality of the training that they're doing, if they're doing it properly. I'm not going to play this the whole way through, but this is a video of the patient using this device just so you have some idea what it actually involves for the patient. And this was an instruction video for a multi-center trial that's just been completed in Holland. Let's hope it works. You will shortly start your training session. During training, it is important to breathe out as much as you can. Then take in a fast, forceful breath through the mouthpiece. Take in as much air as you can and as quickly as you can. Then breathe out slowly and passively until your lungs feel completely empty. Pause until you hear the pacing beep from the device. Repeat 30 times to complete your training. You will now start a training session.
During training, it is important to wear the nose clip. When breathing through the device, place the mouthpiece against your teeth and close your lips around it. You may start now. Start by breathing out as much as you can. You may do this through the device. Now take a fast and forceful breath in. Breathe out again as much as you can. And breathe in as fast and forcefully as you can. Continue like this. As you can see, it's not terribly strenuous, which is the advantage for the patient who isn't perhaps as enthusiastic about the whole body exercise program that I am. And the other advantage of this sort of technique is clearly you can give it to the patient and they can do it at home. It doesn't involve having to go anywhere. And it takes about, once you've got used to it, probably between five and ten minutes for the patient twice a day. On the whole, we would hope that compliance would be better than perhaps with whole body exercise, certainly in the community. So is there any literature to support that this works? It seems, you know, all too easy. It doesn't look very hard. And it seems almost unbelievable that doing something that simple might make a difference to post-operative outcome. But if you also have just read the study that's come from Melbourne where 20 minutes with a physio was enough to reduce your post-op pulmonary complications 50%, perhaps actually very little information or very little training seems to be making quite a big difference. So this was a Cochrane review that was performed in 2013. So there were 12 trials in major abdominal surgery and cardiac elective surgery. And you can see, probably more important than atelectasis, a 55% reduction in post-op pulmonary complications in single centre, small, those are two important caveats, uh, randomised controlled trials. We do know that there does tend to be a tendency in small single centre randomised controlled trials perhaps to overestimate the treatment effect because of enthusiasm and probably an intervention that is delivered in a way that may not be pragmatic across the rest of the health service. But certainly interesting. And there's been a subsequent systematic review just published early this year, looking at, there's a little bit more data in it, but one of the interesting things that this systematic review was to go through details or features of the IMT program that changed in between studies to try and evaluate what was the difference in the studies that were most effective. Because there's a great variability in duration of training, type of training. And this is just to show you the treatment effect. Here we've got line of no benefit. So you can see the overall relative risk is about 0.5 for post-op pulmonary complications. So again, a 50% reduction. Reassuringly, that's the same. And you can see there were three thoracic surgery studies, seven abdominal surgery and seven cardiac surgery, all elective the key element from my perspective is if you look at all of these things, if the patient was older or younger, the sample size was bigger or smaller, the change in the relative risk is very small, all the way down here. Quite reassuringly, in fact, more than 14 days to less than 14 days, there's very little difference, suggesting that you can get very significant effect within two weeks, which is excellent for our tight clinical pathways. So, for example, before cancer surgery, and interestingly, didn't seem to make a huge amount of difference if you did additional whole body exercise to the IMT usual care plus exercise. So a slight reduction again on top of the initial reduction with IMT, but not massive differences. But the one place on here where there is really a very large difference, as often seems to happen, just as I was thinking we had an exercise intervention where no supervised vision was required at all, is this. So that if you didn't supervise them at all, i.e. you sent them off into the dark blue yonder with the machine and said, come back in two weeks, there was no reduction in post-op pulmonary complications. And so, as often happens, it actually turns out that you can even manage to use this device badly if you don't have some additional input apart from your training. So although it looked relatively simple and you saw that person achieving it, it does appear that if you don't have some additional training or at least supervision or at least follow-up for patients that have a problem immediately post, then perhaps the intervention won't be effective. Which quite clearly immediately leads to the question of how much is enough because we want to be pragmatic and have patients not spending too much time in our company or having to come back and forth to hospital. So this has just been published this year, which was the first multi-centre trial looking at esophagectomy patients and they did a high-intensity 60% of MIP, 30 breaths twice a day program, 
in a patient population that we know has a reasonably high risk of post-op pulmonary complications. Well, here is the result, which, as you can see, is disappointing for those of us that felt that this was potentially a positive treatment. But then you look down here and you see the adherence, and this was a first pragmatic trial, which is exactly that there was no supervision at all. This probably explains this. So the reason I'm putting this up is because we're about to embark on a large pragmatic trial and um, it has given us pause for thought and we are particularly focusing on how much and what type of supervision we need to do. So all I would say is that there's good evidence that these devices, well, they certainly don't cause harm and can reduce post-op pulmonary complications, but you do need to train the patients in them properly and you do probably need to follow up after your first intervention. And having spoken to the investigators from that study, everybody felt that you should probably see or at least speak to the patient within the first three to five days, because by that time, most individuals who had a difficulty either with understanding the machine or weren't doing it correctly, you could identify I do just want to point out at this point, you might think that that's reasonably weak evidence, but incentive spirometry, which we seem to be doing all the time, preoperatively and postoperatively, has no supportive literature base. So the Cochrane Review from 2014 was negative in respect to four trials comparing to normal care, to trials comparing to physio or to deep breathing exercises. So it is a different intervention to incentive in spirometry, and there is actually good evidence in randomized controlled trials that IMT works. So if you're considering a preoperative intervention, I would think hard about considering IMT as well as or an additional to incentive spirometry. And in the last few minutes, I'm just going to mention this trial, INSPIRE, which is an inspiratory muscle training study. So this is an HTA-funded RCT. That means the NHS essentially has looked at their Cochrane review and thinks that there is sufficient evidence that this works, but wants to find out if this works in clinical practice. So this is a randomized prospective controlled pragmatic trial to look at implementation of inspiratory muscle training in NHS practice. And it will be a three-arm trial because there is concern about placebo effect uh, with this sort of intervention. So the intervention group will get IMT, as we suggested, for a minimum of two weeks and up to eight weeks before surgery, depending on the preoperative time. The sham arm will get the device, but the resistance will be so low, it'll feel like they're doing something, but it won't be sufficient to change their MIP, and we know that from previous studies. And then there's normal care. It's a big study. We're going to be recruiting 2,500 patients. If anybody would be interested in being a site for this, I'm the clinical CI from Southampton, but we're doing this in combination with Bristol, and the clinical trials unit there with Maria Pufaletti and Chris Rogers and their team. And we are looking for sites or individual sites would like to be involved, so please do uh, consider contacting us. As I said, two to eight weeks preoperatively, 30 breaths twice a day, um, and we will increase the load based on patient uh, symptoms. There will be an internal pilot in this study to evaluate the degree of supervision that's required so there'll be training material that's video and written, and there'll be a teaching package which is standardised, but for the first six months of the trial, half of the patients will be randomly assigned to have an extra visit, and the other half won't, and we'll look at the effect that has on their training profile. So finally, in summary, I think post op pulmonary complications are an important and maybe underestimated cause of morbidity and mortality, and one we haven't focused on perhaps as much as we might. And it looks like they may be amenable to prehab to reduce the incidence. There is evidence to support the use of inspiratory muscle training, and hopefully there'll be more evidence in a couple of years' time when you've put all of your patients into the INSPIRE study. Thank you very much for listening. Top Head Talk. Nima Jerison here. Thanks for listening to Top Med Talk. Now, before we let you go, it's important that we remind you to subscribe to Top Med Talk. That way you'll never, ever miss another episode. Also, if we could encourage you to join us on social media, Twitter, Facebook, LinkedIn, YouTube, pretty much every single social media platform, we're there. Join us. And finally, check out topmedtalk.com. Com. If you go to our website, you can subscribe to email updates. That way we can always tell you where we're going to be, what we're going to be doing and how you can join us. Topmedtalk.com and click on the section marked email updates.
Finally, TopMed Talk is proud to act as the broadcasting arm of EBPOM, evidence-based perioperative medicine. We'd love you to find out more about them as well. EBPOM.org is their website. That's E-B-P-O-M.org. And if you go to EBPOM.org forward slash meetings, you can find out about some of the wonderful meetings that we attend and cover across the year here on TopMed Talk. That's EBPOM.org forward slash meetings.